Thank you everyone for, uh, for coming out today. Um, it's our distinct pleasure to welcome Elizabeth Green, who comes to us from postdoc at Stanford, um, enjoying time in the sun, but is indeed no stranger to the snow, having done a, uh, a PhD up at Cornell and then her undergrad at MIT um, and in math and computer science. Um, it's a really neat talk today because although this position supports our data analytics efforts, which are focused pretty much in all of our programs um, and growing rapidly at Bayer, and more broadly, um, we see a lot of demand across the rest of campus, I think Elizabeth's work is also relevant to the design thinking efforts that are also pretty central to the growth of Bayer and more broadly to our community. Um, so with that, Okay. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Is the, the mic pretty okay? All right. Thanks, Jeff, for that lovely introduction. I'm thrilled um, to be here and for the opportunity to, to talk to you about today about my work, which is aimed at designing, developing, and deploying human-centered computing technologies that help us both better understand as well as support human behavior and well-being. So I want to start off by unpacking that a little bit, in particular what I mean by human-centered, and then what I mean by well-being. So can I get a show of hands maybe of who in the audience recognizes the term human-centered computing or human-centered design, human-computer interaction, human-machine interaction, anything in that realm? OK, thanks. So I just want to be um, explicit about what I mean when I say human-centered computing. Uh, in case we do have a diverse audience um, for whom it's not an entirely familiar concept, um, but also just as a way to share what the research process is like for me. So I like this description um, adapted from the Association for Computing Machinery that describes human-centered computing as a discipline concerned with the de design, evaluation, and implementation of interactive computing systems for human use and with the study of major phenomena surrounding them. So I'll draw your attention first to the fact that these are systems designed for and used by people to support human activities. So what are some examples of such technologies? Well, human-computer interaction grew out of this study of the uh, study and design of um, early user-facing interfaces, starting with graphical interfaces like Ivan Sutherland's Sketchpad in 1963. But nowadays when we talk about computing, we're not just talking about this familiar modern incarnation of a personal computer, right, in today's world, we're really talking about a much broader swath of technology. And I like this National Science Foundation conceptualization that maps out human-centered computing uh, systems across three dimensions. So first, who's using it? So from tool used by one individual to teams of people to whole societies, when we're using it. So from, quote, fixed devices to ones that are mobile and can travel with us, um, like our phones and wearables, to surrounding technologies, such as sensors or media devices embedded in our physical environments. And then from technologies that have a physical form factor uh, to mixed reality systems, all the way to immersive, fully virtual environments. And so as I'll talk about, a lot of my research falls across this design space, depending on whatever I've determined to be the most effective for any given problem. And I'll mention that another reason I really like NSF's definition is because it explicitly calls out that this characterization of human-centered computing is intended to inspire rather than constrain future research because it really is an emerging and a growing field. I'll also highlight that as a human-centered technologist, my research goals are typically twofold. So yes, I'm interested in the engineering challenges of creating these computational artifacts, but I'm equally driven by how their application can help us better understand the human condition, and ultimately how these systems will impact people's lives. And so a key way we do this is by using techniques like design thinking, which is, put simply, methodologies for finding creative solutions to problems. So this is a super high level overview of that prop process that's been popularized by the Stanford D School that in practice aims to deeply engage with stakeholders to learn about and understand their perspectives then rapidly prototyping, deploying to study the impact in real world settings, refining designs, reassessing, and so on in, in this iterative fashion. I'd also like to mention that a good amount of my work is devoted towards 
not only contributions that are technical, empirical, theoretical, but I also work on developing um, new design methodologies. So for example, one of the contributions of my PhD dissertation actually focused on a methodological framework for extending various phases of a design process to also draw on the scientific literature, as well as knowledge and insights gleaned from data, in particular personal data, that can serve as a sort of digital fingerprint um, that I would argue reflects various characteristics of someone. And so bringing it all together, this means human-centered computing really is inherently interdisciplinary, right? To build functional systems, we need computer science and robotics and electrical engineering and mechanical engineering and so on and so forth to make them usable and align the interaction with human capabilities and values. We draw on human factors, psychology, cognitive science, domain knowledge from life and social sciences and other relevant literatures, as I just mentioned, as well as areas like management studies, law, and policy to gain understanding of the total ecology of use, which means both the technical ecology, but also with the larger social system of work practices, procedures, regulations, and culture. All in all, at the end of the day, to create interactive experiences that support and enhance the way human beings work, communicate their quality of life. So before I get into sharing some specific examples of my work that does this, I'd like to give just a brief personal intro about my academic history. It's sort of the, you know, the lens through which I see the world. Um, it influences my work. And also just for any students in the audience, I've found it's really helpful to share stories and experiences to see an example how, of how someone might come to arrive in the sort of interdisciplinary space I inhabit and come to be a human-centered technologist, in case it might help inspire any of your own future choices. So I have, a, as Jeff mentioned, a technical background. I got my bachelor's from MIT in mathematics and computer science. Um, in my early years of undergrad, I actually focused on topics in theoretical computer science. Um, but as time went on, I found myself becoming more and more drawn to human applications. So I started doing research in the uh, computer science and artificial intelligence lab, where I worked on speech recognition and generation systems, semantic web technologies, information management systems. And in my senior year, uh, the grad student and I that we're working on together on one information visualization project, uh, we started entering competitions like the MIT 100K, um, gaining interest from investors. And so although I'd always envisioned continuing straight on to grad school, after some careful deliberation, uh, we co-founded a company after graduation. I spent four years there as the lead engineer and head of experimental features, uh, building tools for visualizing large and complex code bases. The background here is a photo I dug up um, from the incubator space on the Boston Harbor front where we were based during one period as part of Mass Challenge. Um, and one of the things I've had a lot of conversations about already and I really appreciate about Thayer is its explicit emphasis on external engagement, including through entrepreneurial efforts to translate research into practice. But while the engineering challenges at the startup were really motivating, you know, over time, a lot of my startups focus started focusing on sales and I was really keen to get back to an environment um, of more pure research and so I returned to grad school. Um, I'll call out the fact that I chose to go to an information science department um, for my PhD at Cornell, uh, where the faculty were incredibly diverse, from computer scientists like me to mechanical engineers to anthropologists, but at the end of the day where the program was really oriented around advancing a common goal of asking why are we building these systems and what's their human impact as a fundamental part of the research. Again, I really do appreciate this uh, same sensibility from from Thayer where it's less driven by departmental labels and, and more by problems and impact. I also did internships during grad school at large industrial labs like MSR and Google. This is a photo, by the way, of the Ithaca Falls. You can sort of see uh, I lived right next to. So as Jeff mentioned, being originally from the Northeast myself and now living in California is honestly really looking forward to experiencing borderline frostbite <laughs> as part of my trip back, but no such luck, but maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, which brings me to the final piece of my tale. Um, for the past little over a year, I've been a postdoc in computer science at Stanford. Um, I'm a member of the Human Computer Interaction Group. I also work with the Center for Design Research, which is part of mechanical engineering. And I have a number of other collaborations across campus, writing grants and publishing papers with colleagues from civil engineering, psychology, education, the law school. And being in Silicon Valley, uh, I reconnected with the startup scene a bit. So for instance, I actually recently became a an advisor of human-centered product design for a, a company in private beta that uses AI and augmented reality to improve posture and mobility that spent, for people that spend a lot of time at a computer. So all in all, these experiences have given me this strong foundation 
to pursue the development of technology in this balanced way that foregrounds a focus on real world problems and social implications. And it's positioned me well to address my overarching research goal, which is again to design, develop, and deploy human centered technology to assess and support well being. So now let me clarify the well being piece, which is a deliberately broad term I use to encompass whether essentially a person's condition and quality of life are positive based on a variety of interdependent factors, including our physical health, psychological wellness, our education and skills, our social relationships, the natural environment, safety, justice, and fair governance, and so on. And in particular, a lot of my work is aimed at cases where that well-being is threatened, right? So issues of chronic disease, a lack of access to quality education, disenfranchisement from or unfair civic processes, issues that are often referred to as global grand challenges or wicked problems that face society. So the United Nations has identified 17 such global goals recently. The EU similarly has the Horizon 2020 challenges and academic institutes, foundations, think tanks, industry sponsors increasingly launching initiatives and funding efforts to target similar problems too. And most of my work falls into some subset of these, um, investigating how innovative technological solutions can address societal issues. But beyond such scary monster problems I also work on, and there's certainly value in systems that support everyday activities, helping families stay connected, people be productive at their jobs, um, including in particular how technology can keep people healthy in the first place, rather than only fixing things once they're broken. So what I'd like to do now for the remainder of the talk, before concluding with some future directions, is demonstrate these approaches in action, and I'm gonna specifically focus on the context of health. So I may not help to sell too hard um, why health is an important area worthy of attention, but uh, I'll at least sc scope the problem a bit. So we've certainly made great accomplishments in the past century. Life expectancy is up 30 years on average around the world. But as the prevalence of uh, infectious illnesses common in the early 20th century has shrunk, um, incidence has soared for non-communicable diseases, mental health problems, and other chronic conditions that are now the leading cause of disability, sickness, and death around the world. They account for 60% of the global burden of disease, nearly three quarters of all deaths worldwide, and even in low and middle income countries as chronic diseases actually disproportionately affect people in poorer nations. And I can keep throwing terrifying statistics at you, uh, like the fact that the World Economic Forum believes global spending for chronic disease could reach 47 trillion by 2030 as their prevalence continues to grow. But important to note is that these conditions are linked with how people live their lives. So studies consistently show behavior to be the leading health determinant and comprise the top risk factors for premature death, specifically high BMI, excessive alcohol consumption, a lack of physical activity, poor food choices, smoking. In fact, according to the Centers for Disease Control, eliminating just three risk factors, inactivity, poor diet, and smoking, could prevent 80% of heart disease cases, 80% of type 2 diabetes cases, and 40% of cancer cases, which has led public health agencies like the NIH to launch programs to promote behavior change as a priority research area. And there's this growing consensus that the single greatest opportunity to improve health and reduce premature deaths lies in personal behavior, which is a quote from an article by Stephen Schroeder, who's the former head of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, it's the largest health-focused philanthropic organization in the US. So a lot of my work is oriented around this shift in making the individual the nexus of positive behavior change with a focus on overall wellness and prevention. Technology then becomes an appealing pathway for inexpensively delivering this form of continuous personalized care and at scale. So mobile technologies in particular have seen a massive penetration, including the populations who traditionally face uh, barriers to accessing care. And importantly, people seem receptive to using technology to manage their health based on a growing uh, adoption of health-oriented apps and consumer products, which shows the potential for a fundamental shift in individuals' mindsets from my health is the responsibility of my physician to my health is my responsibility and I have the tools to manage it. But <laughs> I will note that despite the swell in such computer, consumer health products, most fail to deliver on this potential and sustain engagement. So previous research, um, including my own actually, when I spent a summer at Google analyzing the Android App Store, indicates that these technologies are abandoned by a third of their users after three months. The Consumer Health Information Corporation uh, similarly found over a quarter of health apps are downloaded and then never used more than one time, with three quarters abandoned by the 10th use. 
And again, I'll come back to this diagram I presented before. I'd argue the main issues are that these, are tool, that these tools are failing are because either they haven't been created through a, a robust human-centered design process, or their approaches have no basis in the scientific uh, literature of what actually works or doesn't work and why, or they fail to make effective use of data to tailor the experience to personal needs. And so a lot of my work has been about developing tools in this more human-centered, theory-informed, data-driven way um, that my research outcomes continue to demonstrate is in fact more effective at motivating and improving a targeted aspect of health, and that additionally, in my experience, leads to people's downright enthusiasm in using these tools. And the piece that I haven't really talked about yet is the data piece, so I'll do that now. So I find it helpful to conceptualize my research in terms of this data pipeline. You could say from collection, so developing novel software and hardware to enhance the capture of personal data, then analytics, so lightweight algorithms that make use of that data to do user modeling, assess a targeted aspect of health, related behaviors, to finally doing interactive, building interactive interfaces that translate data into information, insights, intervention to support self-care and positive change. And these components can be overlapping and iterative, right, as interaction with the system becomes an additional source of input data, it enables refined assessment, health conditions and needs are evolving, and so on and so forth. So over the years, I built, uh, helped others build or advise students in building a number of systems aimed at research in this space of personal health management technology. This is a sampling, it's kind of from left to right, uh, along that pipeline, whether the project's focus was aimed at you know, research on data collection or more on analytics or intervention. So I'll quickly mention a few. I'm not going to go into a ton of depth, just, just to provide a, a flavor of the sort of work I do and in case any, anyone's interested in following up later. So for example, on the assessment side, uh, working with people from mechanical engineering and nutrition at Cornell to develop point of care, uh, rapid diagnostic tools for blood sampling and nutrient testing, targeting low resource settings, specifically India and Peru, or developing mental health management tools as part of an ongoing multi-institutional collaboration. I have folks with, uh, I have with it folks, I have with, I have with folks at Washington and Colorado, specifically to facilitate individuals in monitoring symptoms, um, including through more automated approaches, using the sensors on bo onboard smartphones or wearables, um, but with an emphasis on, on data processing and storage that's privacy sensitive, right? So for example, accessing the microphone but only extracting and locally storing features like spectral content and volume, which are useful for determining social interaction or manic characteristics, but are insufficient to re reconstruct the actual dialogue. Or beyond hardware-based sensors, doing user modeling based on one's technology-mediated behaviors and generated content. Uh, it's what I call soft sensing. This whole column here was basically my dissertation. Um, for instance, one of my first projects in that area is with Scott Counts at Microsoft. Um, mining social network data from Twitter and doing text analytics to computationally evaluate the likelihood of someone maintaining an attempt to quit smoking versus demonstrating behaviors that indicate they're at risk for relapse. As another example, a fair share of my work has been uh, in the area of biological rhythms, so developing analytics platforms for continuous long-term mobile sensing to model and predict people's patterns of sleep and alertness in ways that we've shown are more accurate and clinically relevant uh, than algorithms that aren't informed by chronobiology. Um, recently, I've started plugging those analytics into user-facing tools that provide biologically tailored feedback about a person's ideal time to sleep or wake uh, or do a cognitively demanding task or take a specific medication. And as a final example on the intervention side, um, I've just begun collaborating with the Stanford Partnership in AI-assisted care, where we're designing AI-triggered just-in-time interventions to prompt and hygiene in the hospital or support elder care and aging in place. But today I want to go deeper into two projects, one where the innovation is more on the measurement side, so novel ways to capture data, and one where the innovation is more on the intervention side, so novel ways to translate data to personally meaningful information, insight, and positive change. So first, looking at novel ways to capture data in the context of chronic pain. So this is work that was done when I was a, a senior grad student and now as a postdoc um, with a team of collaborators at Cornell and Wall Medical Center. So the two key players for the app development and the hard hardware fabrication um, for the pieces I'll discuss today were grad students Phil Adams and Alex Adams. And this is research that's been published in um, papers at CHI the last three years. CHI is the 
top hum human computer interaction conference. So chronic pain is defined as recurrent or long lasting pain. Common conditions are arthritis, lower back pain, headaches or migraines, issues arising from injury. They're likely issues that you or someone you know has some experience with because chronic pain does affect 20% of adults globally, 30% of the uh, adults in the US where we're conducting our research. Uh, but prevalence increases with age. So more than half of older adults and uh, as many as 80% of older adults living in nursing homes experience some form of chronic pain. And I'll mention that even as more passive, sensor-based forms of monitoring become increasingly feasible and reliable, self-report still remains an integral part of assessing and in turn treating a variety of health conditions where the experience of living with it is subjective. So when a person self-assesses their pain, it's typically using one of several standard instruments that basically provide a unidimensional access from no pain to pain as bad as it could be, might provide some faces for reference, but when assessed during a doctor's visit, it's typically retrospective. You know, what's your pain been like over the last seven days or month? This can negatively impact accuracy, especially for individuals who, who might have memory or other cognitive impairments. Um, so methods like ecological momentary assessment are designed to collect such perceptions in the moment they're being experienced. And technology was recruited years ago to facilitate this. Early work would send text messages to deliver prompts to record information on paper. And then more recently, technology advanced to the point where it could be used not only to prompt users to record information, but as the recording medium as well. And this allows for more frequent and in situ assessment, but such approaches still face uh, issues with adherence and accuracy, especially if the instrument's cumbersome to use. So our motivation, therefore, was to create self-assessment tools that support accurate, in situ, low burden interaction, which we did uh, through a research through design process that I'll tell you about now. So more specifically, we identified these key constraints important to design around in this context. So first, for reporting interfaces to be highly usable, considering variations in psychomotor and perceptual capabilities, particularly age-related challenges. We also decided to focus on designing for smartphones, which afford interaction modalities like reactive displays and animations that expand the range of ways um, through which individuals could express their pain. Designing again for in-situ use, potentially at home, at work, on the go. Also repeated use, we're, we're designing around a chronic condition. So we don't want an instrument that's usable enough to complete once or occasionally, but that it becomes incredibly frustrating when engaged with more regularly, perhaps for the rest of a person's life. And then designing to facilitate the cognitive effort in translating a complex subjective experience into a single reportable value. So we thought this might be supported by using visual metaphors of a more abstract nature. Or finally, focus on pain might, while reporting it might uh, make pain experiences more salient or increase anxiety. So how can we design interfaces that minimize this? So ideating potential interfaces. Early on, we kept artifacts low fidelity, just rough sketches. Wanted to capture the essence of how different ideas might satisfy these constraints, iteratively designing, uh, discussing, combining, refining. Eventually, what resulted was this set of nine candidate interfaces um, that Phil implemented on Android. I'll briefly walk you through some of these. So in the first interface, a uh, circle slowly fills with color when any part of the interface is touched and held. So a report can be made by resting a knuckle or a nose or a chin on the screen for a desired length of time. This interface uh, provides an oversized number picker widget. Uh, tapping anywhere on the top half increments the value while tapping anywhere on the bottom decrements it. Uh, many fingers uh, allows a respondent to report their level of pain by touching the screen with a certain number of fingers simultaneously. Uh, photos people is our five item rating scale where instead of numbers, pain levels along the axis are represented with photographs that we harvested uh, from Flickr, tagged with 18 words describing degrees and qualities of pain. Photos nature is the same idea, but pain levels are conveyed via abstract uh, and landscape images like of a lightning bolt or a serene lake rather than faces. And then we also implemented well established pain assessment instruments, but in a more user-friendly, accessible, sensitive fashion. So for example, number seven uses a custom seek bar widget that dramatically increases the target touch region. Number nine is an adaptation of the face's pain scale that enables a user to smoothly transition across the face images by sliding a finger up or down the screen. So at this point, we brought people experiencing chronic pain to the lab to provide feedback about these various designs, which they'd also provided feedback before together with clinical pain experts. Um, specifically, the individual would interact with each of these candidate interfaces in a random order, using them to report current pain level, providing reactions and feedback, including a reflective compare and contrast where they would rank the interfaces on four dimensions of usability. Then in another round of the design and implementation, we 
selected and combined and, and refined elements from the nine candidate interfaces aiming to balance our design guidelines with the participants' feedback. So for instance, uh, people largely found using photorealistic images distressing, like in number four, so we moved in the more abstract direction of number nine. Whereas another example, participants liked the oversized display of number two, but they thought tapping to report was time consuming. So small touch targets though, like the radio buttons of number eight, were leading people to make misreports. So given the importance of quick as well as accurate reporting, we opted for number nine's, uh, or excuse me, number six's more familiar and intuitive slider, but we still wanted to provide a generous touch area. So putting it all together, these were our two resultant measures, again, fully implemented on Android. Both interfaces had a, a dual interaction mode, so the user could either tap or swipe anywhere on the screen to control the slider on the side. And then we were ready for field deployment to validate the measures. So we had a sample of 12 people use the measure for three weeks in everyday life, which is the length of time the literature is considered sufficient for this sort of validation. Uh, it was an experience sampling style protocol, so participants would get a notification twice a day to report pain using a validated zero to 10 scale, one of our two measures, plus a subjective usability assessment, um, and they would have the uh, option to provide unstructured feedback. So to give you the results, we saw um, an overall response rate of 90%. Both measures strongly correlated with the validated instruments, indicating their robustness as a self-report measure. Uh, and our, our, both our measures were generally found to be somewhat easier, very easy to use. But importantly, we found that usability perceptions uh, were not unanimous across participants or even within the same participant across different reporting sessions. Um, plus, participants used to the system in everyday life had encumbered a number of additional self-assessment challenges and constraints. Uh, first, our participant identified a number of context where using a phone is impractical or inappropriate, plus it could be relatively time consuming to pull out the phone and make a self-report. Even if it is possible to use, interacting with a smartphone can still be quite high, um, the burden of it. So especially if someone's dealing with dig low digital skills or, or cognitive vision or motor impairments. And so these challenges then motivated the next phase of our research where our aim was now to support more intuitive natural interactions with uh, self-assessment interface, and in particular we wanted to focus on touch. So we, would, we took this approach after observing the way people in moments of pain would sometimes instinctually grasp you know, the hand of a loved one or uh, the arms of a chair or some ob other object nearby. And we were further inspired by the uncomplicated action of squeezing a stress ball, which can also be unobtrusive and quite private. And so seeking to integrate these types of interaction with intentional self-report, uh, we created a compressible stick, which has many of the same affordances as a ball, but not nearly as many physical design challenges from an engineering point of view. So we called our device Kepi. Uh, it's Finnish for stick. None of the team was Finnish, but we thought it was an aesthetically pleasing, uh, non-threatening, and easily anthropomorphized kind of a name uh, that participants responded well to. Plus, it sounds a lot better than stick. Uh, we first explored a variety of commodity pressure sensors, but we found problems um, in the signal. Um, their inability to even withstand the, the force of a person's grip. So Alex built a custom force sensitive resistor that could handle high thresholds of pressure, but also having good resolution um, and sensitivity to lower pressures. Um, we also explored various materials, ultimately selecting a soft, soft polyurethane rubber um, that combined with this soft compressible conductive foam underneath, uh, provided a good balance in tactile sensation and control. And it also demonstrated rapid recovery and it was really resilient to tearing or misshaping. Our version two ended up being developed because of a few major drawbacks related to version one. Um, basically, when heavy uh, or rapid compression of the device took place, uh, version one's outer electrode would crinkle, it would deform its shape, the phone's resistive qualities, whereas uh, version two's FSR demonstrated a much higher resolution due to the proximity and size of the electrodes and provided a user with much more control over the signal. Also, based on Complaints about version one's too stiff cotton cover. We used a flexible thin latex in version two that was foam, firm enough to hold everything together, but also allowing the sensor to return to a normal state um, rapidly, even after elongated periods of intense manipulation. And so at this point, we were ready to bring people into the lab to more formally evaluate Kepi. So we ran a study with 29 participants, excuse me, 28 participants. The goal here was to assess user receptivity and identify additional needs, as well as verify two key assumptions. So first, can this input technique achieve sufficient reporting resolution to capture low, medium, and high levels of reporting, which would map to levels of pain intensity the literature indicates is necessary for assessment? And so to test this, we tasked participants with reporting a medium intensity value and release, a high intensity value and release, and a low intensity value and release. 
And people would repeat this twice, once while receiving visual feedback of the squeeze pressure they were applying. It was just using a slider widget um, on a laptop screen with no numbers that, that Kepi transmitted data to. And then they did the task again with no visual feedback. We found that the means of low, medium, and high reporting levels were significantly different in the visual feedback condition. Right, so you want to look at the differences with blue bars, um, as well as no visual feedback conditions. So this is the green bars. Plus a two-way ANOVA between the visual feedback and no visual feedback conditions um, overall showed no significant difference. So now we're comparing the blue and green bars at low, medium, and high levels, which altogether indicates that participants were able to report these distinct three varying intensities, both with and without visual feedback. So verified assumption one. And my low could be different than your low, my low, high, and your high. And so we could imagine uh, a task like this as a calibration step a new user of a device might perform. So on to assumption two, can users make sense of and use Kepi to map intended pain level to squeeze intensity? So for this one, people watched an animation of a red circle tracing a series of sinusoidal curves and a step function, and they'd use Kepi to continuously um, report the more intense and less intense values traced. Again, both with and without visual feedback. And a visual inspection of the data indicated participants on average track the baseline curve very well and a cross-correlation among tracking curve, visual feedback, and no visual feedback confirmed that each of these series were pairwise highly cross-correlated. So this was great, and it confirmed our second assumption that people can use Kepi to map an inten intended pain level to squeeze intensity, together verifying the basic building blocks of interaction that would be required of this device to make it feasible for pain assessment. And then in addition to assessing um, open technical challenges, um, of building this device, our other main focus was on questions of usability. So on the positive side, uh, people assumed squeezing to be the interaction modality correctly. Uh, this you know, squishy form factor really invites such a grip. The squishiness in particular um, seemed to make Kepi genuinely enjoyable to use. Participants on the whole thought the mapping from squeeze intensity to pain level made sense for all Kepi versions, as we'd hoped. And a really interesting finding was that Kepi was also seen as a potential outlet um, for pain with squeezing as a way to release and externalize negative pain perceptions. But there were some negative reactions and reservations as well. So for instance, people would rather squeeze Kepi a certain number of times or for a certain duration of time rather than using uh, pressure to report, or they worried about unintentional logging, they wanted to receive confirmation of a reported value. But the, the big one I'll focus on is an issue of bulkiness or heaviness people thought could impact portability. And the idea kept coming up of how desirable a more lightweight wearable Kepi would be. So we built that. So Kepi version 3 is a coin-shaped disc and a small cylinder, um, where the main difference with the previous versions, besides size and shape, obviously, is the electrode design, the type of foam used in the FSR and the casing. And we fabricated both as a necklace and a keychain, though they could be modified to take on many form factors. So now to assess reactions, particularly whether the smaller wearable form factor was, in fact, appreciated, um, we did a series of interviews with seven additional people, all older adults, and this time with version 3, none of them found it to be bulky or heavy. Most preferred the flat coin-shaped form factor over the cylindrical shape. That was kind of like a, a mini version of the big Kepi. But regardless of the specific um, look and feel, participants had two main priorities. They wanted it a uh, device to be handy and readily accessible throughout the day, which would make a body-worn Kepi appealing, but at the same time largely preferred the ability to wear it in a way that was inconspicuous or to have the aesthetics make it look like something that, that wasn't a medical device. And so going forward, Kepi indicates this strong potential for novel devices and wearables to support more naturalistic self-report in a number of domains about a variety of personal data. So we can imagine Kepi being worn on the body or kept in a pocket, being used unobtrusively. But similar pressure-based sensors uh, could be wrapped around a car steering wheel, embedded in the arms of a dentist chair. Uh, Grip-style interfaces also have a number of potential applications in domains beyond pain and health, um, such as squeezable input devices for gaming or other controllers. I'm especially keen to initiate researchers, uh, research with populations for whom it's difficult to precisely capture um, self-perceptions through traditional forms of communication. So we could imagine developing pressure sensors for um, embedding in toy-based form factors, such as a squeezable stuffed animal to aid um, self-expression in the pediatric context. So you know, now if we revisit this pipeline, a lot of those ideas are focused on novel ways to enhance data collection, but moving down the pipeline to analytics, I actually just got a small grant um, through the NIH to deploy these interactive uh, smartphone intangible devices as part of research to collect a much larger data set from which we can analyze and, and build predictive models of in situ 
idiosyncratic uh, pain intensity patterns. And eventually I'll be instantiating those models in uh, informatics tools that actually help individuals learn about their personal pain patterns and contributing factors, and then uh, take personalized chronotherapy. Okay, and as I mentioned, I'd like to share just one other project, this one more on that informatics and intervention side. So you mentioned the pretty abysmal um, retention rates of health apps in general. More specifically, a huge part of the problem is the information being provided back to the user. So in particular, conventional feedback tends to be quantitative, right? It's charts and graphs, it's statistical reports, but research, again, including my own, shows people find this information hard to interpret. It's overwhelming, it's demotivating. Also how it's delivered, so notifications or reminders, this is intrusive, inopportune. As a result, they mostly go ignored. And finally, long-term engagement. So we know that most trackers or apps are a neat trinket at first, but end up in a drawer or otherwise abandoned for most people pretty quickly. So a lot of my work um, in this area has been aimed at re-envisioning these conventional information design and delivery approaches to investigate more qualitative, intuitive representations of personal information that involves engaging with data through games or novel visualization designs based on the mental imagery and the lived experiences that those data represent or mixed media, audio, haptics, actuated devices, but they're all aimed at expanding the, the range of ways people can more qualitatively engage with their data. And so one of the many reasons um, I wanted to do a postdoc at Stanford and work with James Landay was he'd been responsible for seminal work in this space, like UB Green and the UB Fit Garden, that represent tracked activities using features like the height of a flower rather than, say, the height of a bar chart. And so now we've been working together um, on this platform that uses data to drive graphic narratives that prevent present information in a way that's more meaningful to people and more likely to inspire action. So Cindy Jang, a recent graduated master's student, has really been instrumental um, in development, though this is another big team effort um, involving especially a lot of undergraduate students and uh, women. If you've been noticing the photos, these human-centered research topics and approaches really are a fantastic way to attract women to computing and engineering. So for this system, we're specifically targeting the use case of promoting physical activity, which as I mentioned earlier is one of the top risk factors for premature death. Again, primary contributor to at least 18 diseases and disorders. In the US, more than three quarters of adults fall short of activity targets. It's estimated over five million annual deaths worldwide could be prevented just by increasing physical activity. And so our solution to increase awareness, nudge behavior, and ultimately drive long-term engagement and change uses narrative-based feedback to visualize a user's activities and progress as components of a multi-chapter story that's ambiently displayed on a user's smartphone screens. So the basic gist is that our protagonist, Zuki, is this little space alien who ventures to Earth on a mission uh, to save his planet and find his brother encountering diverse scenes, characters, and sub-challenges along the way. So for tracking activity, we support both automated and manual logging. Specifically, we use the activity inference uh, supplied by Google Fit to automatically detect walking and running biking. By launching the app, people can edit and delete recorded activities, add other activities, and we also provide access to historical data to, to facilitate self-reflection about past behavior as it relates to long-term goals. Then we visualize all these activities and achievements as components of a multi-chapter narrative that resides on the phone's lock screen and home screen. So this provides at-a-glance feedback that further reduces barriers to information, considering people glance at their phones on the order of 80 to 200 times a day. You'll also notice the interface contains several types of real-time positive feedback. So first, logged activities are stylized as small icons thematically related to the storyline of the current chapter. So in this space chapter, it's the stars in the sky. Each time a user logs an activity, an icon is populated at the top of the screen. We encode activity type using different colors and sizes. So blue for biking, red for running, yellow for walking, purple for other things people have logged. 30 minutes are, get small icons, 60 minutes get big icons. Achievement towards a goal is also reflected by the plot progressing. So you know, here, Zuki's getting closer and closer to his own goal of reaching Earth, as well as by progress indicators in the bottom right corner of the screen. And then finally, completion of a weekly goal unlocks the next chapter. So we had 13 to provide at least a three month long experience, each with five parts. So this is the full set. And then they're all tied together by this backstory of Zuki, an overarching plot that links together, links together the chapters in this episodic structure, including a start and a middle and an end, a protagonist and antagonist, challenges that the user must help overcome throughout. 
And the narrative really was the key part. So we worked closely with narratology professors from the English department in refining the story as well as with users. So again, doing multiple rounds of user studies to enhance the narrative's comprehensibility and lure. And just to be clear, there's a good body of knowledge around why narratives are compelling, which helps suggest you know, levers we can pull as designers to create a narrative likely to be successful at motivating behavior change. Once again, the system was created through an iterative research through design process. So we've got early stage steps like constructing personas and storyboarding, prototyping, testing at various valleys like paper, um, to developing progressively more high fidelity interfaces that we continue to vet and refine through both very large online scale surveys, um, large scale online surveys, as well as smaller scale in lab interviews and user tests. But rather than just you know, walking you through that process like I did with the pain, I just want to highlight a few key takeaways. So first, we found that the visual components of the narrative mattered the most to people. They expressed a preference for the visual of the story to be comprehensible on its own. So we worked to improve the standalone legibility of the visual, short and lengthy accompanying text. Storylines that depended on too much text also hindered the glanceability of the display. So did things like where Android places notifications on the screen, which influenced us to put uh, progress indicators you know, at the top of the bottom to avoid competing with other visual elements as much as possible. People also liked really having really obvious visual markers of progress, including to celebrate achievement of goals. So we retooled where on the screen the feedback appeared and what direction it grew. We added this fun celebratory overlay at 100% progress. We also saw that having an emotional attachment to the story was really key to maintaining engagement with the system and one's goals. So for instance, the original framing of the narrative was Zuki coming to Earth to save his home planet. Uh, but after user studies, we ultimately shifted the primary backstory to be the journey was driven by Zuki's uh, need to search and rescue his brother. We also identified a need for the story to be more emotionally arousing. So there were several original chapters people felt were predictable that help us rework content to be more, um, have more cliffhanger suspenseful transitions to keep people curious and engaged. And other characters um, like the antagonist um, helped us uh, build more rich emotional richness for people. Finally, a big takeaway we saw was uh, the need for thematic coherence. So for instance, people really needed a logical relationship between completing fitness goals and this plot line. So we'd had one chapter where Zuki rode a camel across the desert without exerting himself. People really felt a disconnect with that, whereas they liked chapters where Zuki's own challenges required climbing or flying or jumping and swimming, so physically exerting actions that resonated better with their fitness mission. Um, Another example, we had some fitness icons that weren't perceived as thematically relevant to the scenario, um, which really bugged people. So we really saw the little details matter too. But these are all really interesting from a design perspective, but a big question is, of course, can this approach actually get people to move more? So again, research through design process, we've been iterating um, on prototyping and testing for some time, but now we're at the point where we've refined the robustness of the data platform as well as the user experience to the point where we're ramping up to launch. Uh, long-term deployment, but as part of preparing, we have been field testing. So I'm actually excited that we have some very fresh results that I may not have been analyzing a bit on the plane, but our pilot deployment that I can share uh, with you today. So this was a three-week field trial with 16 people. Um, half of them got the multi-chapter narrative, the other half just got a more UbiFit style visualization to really make the narrative be the key variable being manipulated. And we also captured analytics data about both fitness behaviors as well as metrics of app engagement. So in terms of behavior, did the narrative impact it? Yes. People who got the multi-chapter narrative fared better at attaining their goals. And it wasn't because narrative participants simply set fewer or, or easier goals. They actually set more goals of longer duration. In terms of activity, the duration of activities progressively decreased for people in the non-narrative condition. But narrative participants actually remained relatively stable. They even climbed a little bit in the following week, logging 17% more activities and also completing 40% more minutes of activity in terms of duration, even at the end of the study compared to non-narrative participants. Beyond behavioral changes, um, we also saw uh, shifts psychologically. So we found participants who got the narratives were more hopeful about their physical activity, experienced more positive moves. And looking at the progress through uh, stages of behavior change, we found that half of narrative participants advanced at least one stage, the remaining two, uh, excuse me, where in the non-narrative condition, only one person advanced, the other two, um, Five showed no change, and the remaining two actually saw reverse psychological progress in terms of their readiness and self-efficacy around changing their behavior. And then finally, we measured users' engagement with both the system and the story. Based on screen on-off logs, we, we found participants who received the narrative glanced at users' 
So these images display 30% more on average. Those glances lasted longer for the narrative per condition participants. And we also use the narrative engagement scale to assess key dimensions associated with the story's persuasiveness, uh, empathy, ease of cognitive access, perspective taking and involvement, and narrative participants reported greater engagement with the story across all dimensions. So in terms of next steps, you know, given the encouraging public, uh, pilot deployment, certainly moving ahead with the full multi-month long study, uh, well powered with participants in the hundreds, I'm also currently extending the platform to additional use cases beyond general fitness. So I'm working with a student in biomechanics uh, to support osteoarthritis management and mobility, as well as employing story elements to not only passively reflect, but also intelligently recommend activities. So um, think about Zuki as not just being a character in the story, but a reinforcement learning agent that directly interacts with the user to issue activity quests in an adaptive fashion. And as part of developing these systems, it's also going to be important to identify methods for generating such content in a scalable way. So now if we pop back up uh, to this overarching motivation, you know, what might be next on a research agenda? So in my final few minutes, I'd just like to talk about some promising future directions <coughs> that I believe are, are quite exciting. Hopefully will inspire you um, in interesting ways as well. I won't have time to go into a ton of detail, but I'll try to give a mix of kind of higher level open-ended examples as well as some that are more concrete. So first, continuing on the health domain specifically, um, I mentioned how a big part of my work is this motivation for technology to help us shift from a largely reactive, visit, test, treat approach and more toward being preventive, personalized, self-driven models of care. So going forward, I really want to push on this preemption piece, which means predictive analytics, machine learning that can forecast health outcomes. Um, but beyond those computational challenges, also translating those models into actionable feedback. So just-in-time interventions, you know, intelligent real-time support that adapts based on a, current, a person's current status or context to deliver care when she's in need or receptive of it. Although ideally, they wouldn't only be delivered just in time at or near the moment of crisis, but instead I really want to push on these before things break interventions that help people maintain a relative state of wellness. So clearly technical challenges here, but again, as with all my work, a lot of open questions to be addressed on the human end as well. For instance, how do we break bad news about a forecasted health problem in a way that's motivating rather than distressing um, and just exacerbates the problem. Also, I focused a lot in this talk on physical health, um, but my past and future agenda is, is broader in terms of the space of well-being, including as related to dimensions like cognition, emotional wellness, and social relationships. So first I'll mention that when it comes to uh, data-enabled intelligent systems, I prefer the philosophy that frames them as not autonomous systems that are going to imitate and replace humans, but rather as supplements, tools that enrich our innate and human activities. So things like our creativity, our desire to learn, uh, our cooperative nature. So when it comes to creativity, one direction I'm excited about is cognitive science and neuroscience informed interactions. So for example, that literature led me to hypothesize that defocused attentional states um, boost creative thinking. So activities like walking or showering, you've probably had a light bulb moment in the shower, right? Um, driving, so on. Uh, I recently ran some pilot experiments in a car simulator we have on the Stanford campus, um, and the results really were quite promising. So a lot of opportunities, I think, to develop interactive systems that prime these cognitive neurological states, including during every activities like a car commute, um, or as technology uh, supported techniques and say the, the toolkit of a, a design team to spark ideation as part of professional practices. For creativity also has strong links with both our physical and psychological wellness. And so tying back into health again, I'm particularly interested in the therapeutic potential of technology mediated creative activities as well. So think clinical art therapy, but on a new personalized digitally augmented level. And then several compelling directions related to kids specifically. So how can we build models, um, excuse me, mobile tutoring systems that deliver adaptive context aware activities that support body cognition, more uh, equitable access to quality education, or I see not just a big opportunity, but also a pressing need to develop methods for obtaining the labeled data on which these intelligent systems depend, right? So instead of paying annotators or using CAPTCHA walls that force people to label things before they get to their digital destination, thinking about these use cases where the person values sharing that sort of information too. So for instance, parent-child interactions um, around common sense knowledge acquisition uh, 
and developing interactions and reward functions that really balance the benefits to the AI with the, balance, uh, the benefits to the human. Another key dimension going forward is on the interaction itself. So developing techniques that support more natural, intuitive interactions with um, these systems that I'm envisioning. I'm interested in, uh, in moving beyond traditional graphical user interfaces, um, in particular towards more embodied interactions. You know, touch, movement, voice, um, humans really are made to make sense of and manipulate the physical world um, in these ways. So massive design and engineering opportunities to build interactive systems that give data a physical embodiment that can leverage this innate dexterity that we have. I also think there's a lot of promising game-based approaches to interaction. Um, psychology shows play-based activities are really fundamental behavioral building blocks. And then a final direction where I see numerous opportunities is smart environments that are more aware of and responsive to occupant status, needs, their overall well-being. So first, by establishing the basic science of human environment interaction through data-driven observational studies, lab experiments, and deployment of these ubiquitous sensing platforms, I've started to work with students to build to determine how built spaces impact human outcomes. And then using those insights to develop digitally augmented physical infrastructures, for instance, chronobiology aware spaces that adapt conditions like lighting or temperature um, to stabilize a person person's rhythms are, are just one natural extension of my circadian computing research that I'm pushing on first. So then just to, to wrap up, bring us back to the big picture, you know, I hope I've given you a glimpse into how technology can help tackle globally shared problems by transforming how we monitor, understand, and attempt to positively influence behavior on a broad scale. And I've tried to give you a sense today, not just of the topics and the research questions that interest me and where I see a lot of opportunity going forward, but also how to actually go about doing that kind of work. And particularly the importance of new methods and approaches for addressing messy, complex, emerging issues that society faces, where I believe human-centered design and engineering is really well positioned to do this. But I think it can be either further elevated by marrying design with, again, domain knowledge from that application area as well as data-driven techniques that either mine data from our digital traces or enable user-driven data collection that leverage those data to extract insights about human behavior and well-being, and then ultimately engineering interactive technologies that translate data and information, insight, and positive change. I think there offers uh, really this fantastic environment for taking these ideas seriously and addressing real-world problems um, through the sorts of entrepreneurial, innovative, and transdisciplinary approaches that are needed for this kind of research. So it's been a real pleasure for me to be here and have an opportunity to connect with you um, so a huge thank you to you, also a huge thank you to all the amazing people I've collaborated with all, over the years, um, the funding sources that have supported my work, and with that I'll stop. <laughs>